Son, Holy Spirit, please be seated. The wicked servant was the one who did not forgive, would not forgive, could not forgive. The wicked servant was the one that was delivered over to the torturers. Why was he wicked? Because he had begged for forgiveness and it was granted. And when his fellow servant begged him for forgiveness, he denied it. Not only did he not grant forgiveness, he caused him harm. Listen, the Lord has justified his wickedness. Causing harm to one another, is wickedness. Harming one another is wickedness. If then you have already been forgiven your sins, this just happened by the way, assuming you're sorry for them. If you come to the Lord and say, forgive me all where I sinned against you, it's already forgiven. Why? Because he's already died on the cross, resurrected from the dead. And has opened up the pathway for all believers to have forgiveness of their sins. To enter into the new reality, the new existence, the new relationship with God. The absolutely access to heaven itself at all times without any further uh, motion is necessary. But the ones who are not able to forgive others are deemed to be wicked servants. Wickedness. Thrown into the debtor's prison until you paid the last cent. These are words of uh, knowledge that you should know that it is your job to forgive sins on earth. Why you were born. It's why you are here. To receive forgiveness of yours and to pass it on to others the same forgiveness. You know, in medieval times, they said, well, nobody's perfect. I can't, I can forgive most sins, but I, there are just some sins that I just can't bring myself to forgive. Because they're too egregious. They hurt too bad. Therefore, I'm going to carry around my hatred for that person who, who did this to me. We know people who have suffered a great deal, especially when they were children, Innocent people taken advantage of harm in many different ways. Many different ways. And I have people telling me, I was raped when I was six years old. I can't forgive him. Why not? Because I still feel him doing I can't let go of it. which I say, who have you harmed? The answer almost invariably is, I've harmed, I've harmed myself, I've done it to myself, I've hurt myself with drugs or inappropriate behaviors or crimes, thefts, name-calling, belittling, condemnation. I say, how can you possibly expect the Lord's mercy for you when you're not willing to show this mercy? I can't let go of it. In medieval times, they had, they came up and invented the whole church, invented a, a process by which you could get rid of this gray area. Not fully forgiven, but also not fully forgiving. 
they called it purgatory, and they put a tax on it. So you could pay the church, and they'll sort of look the other way for that. You get days off of your time in purgatory for certain indulgences that you can get by listening to the sermon of the Pope or doing some goodwill or observing feast days or daily mass is a thing like that. You can do things on earth that would get you time off measured in days, earth days in heaven, in purgatory. So that your time in the debtor's prison would be paid off early. There were whole religious orders who came up with this and said, well, since we're, we're going to take upon ourselves the sins of mankind and they're going to go around in public parading through the city streets with whips, whipping each other, whipping each other until the point where they drew blood. And the people would say, oh, how holy they are. completely missing the point of this gospel. Describing to God human properties when he is a not a human. God is not human. Jesus, the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, is fully God, is fully man, but the perfect man, as Adam was created to be. He calls himself the Son of Man. So that Adam being created perfect, Son of Man being created perfect without sin, is to undo the effects of sin. If Adam had been able to forgive, who? If he had been able to, which is conjecture on my part, if Adam had been able to forgive Satan the sin of enticing Eve to sin, therefore enticing himself to sin, if he were able to cry out to God, O oh Lord, have mercy on me as I have mercy on Satan, because what a tormented soul Satan must be. We don't know the outcome. Would it have undone the effect of original sin right there? Or would centuries have to go by and generations to go all the way down to Jesus where Jesus would say, forgive them for they know not what they do. We hear that we are allowed to have people who speak in tongues. What he recommends? Yeah. If you have two or three of you in your congregation that speak in tongues, go ahead and do it. But not unless you have someone who can interpret the tongues. Anybody in here interpret tongues? I don't think so. Therefore, we don't do it. Other churches, they have snakes crawling around, they have people speaking in tongues, and people standing up and saying, I have the prophecy about that tongue. Okay. Almost 100% of the time, it is something that's completely off base from divine things. As to do with here and now, and maybe winning the lottery, or maybe some, some good fortune that could occur, or bad fortune. St. Paul doesn't mention 
what would happen if you had a church filled with interpreters? A church filled with prophets? A church filled with contemplatives, people who were so close to God that they could feel His presence at all times. To the state of which they were so connected to God that they, the idea of sin never enters into their mind or thought stream or their actions. In other words, if they were perfectly forgiven and perfectly forgiving. If they were able to estate, uh, uh, attain to that state of grace where they were so anticipatory of God and God so anticipatory of them that they could feel each other's actions at all times. Much like Jesus himself when he walked the earth. That state of grace that people could come and touch his garment and be healed by the energy, by the holiness, by the compassion. We had a church filled with people infused with this with the light of consciousness of God. What would it be like? We wouldn't need anybody speaking in tongues to interpret for them because they would already know. They would already have this within themselves, in their consciousness, in their being, in their actions, their comings and goings, in all day. See? The relationship with God is something that is open to each and every one of us. There are churches where people are encouraged to come up, get down on your knees, and let's pray over you and help that you will have some religious experience by infused grace. That's not our style. It's implied. It is implied in the sacrament of the Eucharist. How? If you understand this gospel and the commandment that goes that says, if you would be forgiven, you must forgive. And to the extent that you are forgive, a forgiving person, you are being forgiven. To the extent that you can let go of the earthly anger, the earthly hatred, the earthly things that separate, divide us who are saved from those heathens out there who are going to hell. If you can imagine that there's nothing at all that separates us from the love of God, except our willingness, our free will acceptance of Him. So how do we get to this state? I know and have met people who are very much in this state of life all the life. Monks, nuns, people who meditate on the, on the identity of Christ all day long, all night, who are able to say with every breath, Lord, have mercy. Oh, my Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And to bring about every inclination of sin into their, into their mind, everything of jealousy, hatred, envy, avarice, ambition, pride, vainglory, hypocrisy, impurity, to bring into their mind and their being and purge it through, going through line by line, like an account of doing an audit, and be able to purge these things out by the infused grace of God who forgives on being asked to forgive. Lord have mercy. And He forgives them. And they do their best, having this ever on their mouths, in their, in their thoughts, and in their minds. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. But they are till those people will tell you in their endeavor to be so filled with Christ in their own self 
they forget to give Christ to the next person that they meet. To give him fully without reservation, without holding anything back, but to offer forgiveness of sins for all your life. And we call this love. This is possible. You don't have to be a saint. You don't have to be Mother Teresa, who's one of the people that I've met. You don't have to be Father Flavian. You don't have to be these monks who are contemporaries and sick and secluded hermits. You don't have to be that way. It helps in formation if you have some training because an ordinary person has difficulty doing this because there's too much noise. Too much hurt, hurt from us. Too much uh, chaos. So that it's, we're constantly in the ring being punch, 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 punch. Can't quiet down. The contemplative Christian life is possible for the busiest of souls. You can work 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, doing your job. You could interact with people all day long. You could be a policeman in the street interacting with criminals. Death, destruction, threats, violence, every kind of attack, every kind of uh, assault all day long and still have peace within yourself. So that the Christ that dwells within you is being transferred to the next person. Even as you do your job. work in a bakery, you work in a grocery store, you'll be working outside, working in uh, doing landscaping or shoveling snow. We see very fine examples of this today. This week we had a terrible hurricane go through Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina. And we see an outpouring of people to help, to relieve suffering, to rescue, to aid and comfort. And many of these people, I've seen them, <laughs> it's the beauty of technology, we can see them live stream, passing along the blessings of Christ. Let's say that you have hurts within your soul that are, you just find it so hard to forgive. I can't forgive that person. I can forgive an indifferent person, the bus driver, I can learn in the, the checkout lady at the, at the grocery store. I can forgive them because I don't know what they've done. I don't know what their sins are committed. I can forgive them. All your sins are forgiven. God will have mercy on me. But to forgive your father, to forgive your mother, to forgive your close ones, your trusted one, who betrayed you, who did you wrong, sold you out. It's hard. You are given a comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, who, upon invitation into your life, oh Holy Spirit, come into me, give me the strength to be able to resolve this issue within my soul. And it may take some time. It may take a number of years, in fact, before your psychological profile is able to go ahead and make the step of crossing over that threshold that's so, it's like a wall have to be able to walk through the wall of forgiveness. 
this comforter is working on you. It's a process. Working, working, working on you like kneading the dough. Working this holiness throughout the whole batch of you. So that at some point you might be able to resolve this conflict within you that says, I was hurt so bad, therefore I can't forgive it. I can't let it go. I'm going to carry around this hurt with me for all my days. And beyond. Which I say, do you really want to? Do you really want to carry along this wound? Do you really want to or can you let it go? so that liberator and captive are set free at the same time. Because if there's no more victim, there's no more victimizer. You're free. By reaching out right now to Jesus God the Father Holy Spirit all the angels and saints here infuse into me the grace that lets me know God's will in my life now if you're willing you can heal me if you're willing, you can forgive me. If you're willing, you'll give me mercy. If you're willing, you'll lift this up off of me so that then I'll be able to pass it along. You notice in this gospel message this morning where the man went to the master, the property owner, his employer, and He's trying to reconcile his accounts. You owe me 10000 Pay up. I can't do it. Please have mercy on me. I can't do it. Well, I'm going to sell you and your whole family down the river to make up for my losses. Please don't do it. Forgive me. Please forgive me. I will pay you eventually. To which it happened, was forgave the debt. You notice that that happened first before the servant went out and was unforgiving to the other servant and caused him harm. That's the order of things. You who believe in Christ Jesus have your debt canceled. Your original sin is over. It's canceled. You don't have it. It's been rectified. You have every right to go into heaven because it's opened up for you who believe. Now you can go to the other ones and say, I've forgiven you your debts. So that you can enter also into my Father's kingdom. Where we're all respected. There is no rank or privilege. There's no elite. There's no uh, lords and masters and servants and serfs. There's none of that. Everyone is honored and respected for their existence because they exist in Christ. This uh, is uh, a beautiful thing about our faith, why we have a religion. The infused contemplation, the infused uh, connection between you and Christ himself and, and the Holy Spirit of God coming through you into this knowledge to anticipate what would you have me do. Remember they used to have these little wristbands that we what WWJD, you put that on a kid and say, if you come to a, a decision you have to make, look at this wristband and says, what would Jesus do? And so you could be reminded. If you 
don't have to look anymore, but you can anticipate what Jesus would do, then you'd be doing it already before the conflict comes into place. The conflict can be avoided. The whole, con the whole conflict, the whole uh, crisis can be avoided many times by anticipating the grace of God into the situation. Peacemaking at its finest. So, in this liturgy, where we are about to receive Jesus himself in earthly form of bread and wine, but we also not only are we receiving Jesus himself in bread and wine, we're receiving the communion souls. So that everyone who ever lived is still living in Christ and we are communing with all of them in the new Jerusalem, the new world, the new kingdom. So if you can enter in to this concept of the forgiven who are forgiving are entering in together into the kingdom of God. What an honored assembly it is. And it's yours. Move on for it. Enjoy it.